Hello my bookish friends out there in booktube land and welcome to another episode of Tristan and the Classics. In this video we're going off piste. We're going to be taking a look at some phenomenally funny GCSE exam answers which come from the 1990s so they're not just made up for a laugh. So without further ado let's have a chuckle shall we? Before we start, you might be wondering why would a booktuber put this kind of video on a book channel? Well, it's simple to me. It's because books are about words and evoking imagery and all those kind of things. And in exam answers, someone is trying to put their thoughts onto paper. But if you've misheard something, misunderstood something, or just put the words together incorrectly, you can come up with the most fantastic flights of fancy, which conjure the most amusing things inside our heart and give us a giggle. I'll just add before we carry on that I'm not making fun of anybody, please don't take it like that. I've made my own fair share of, you know, blunders. Um, it's just sometimes when words are put together, they just have the most amazing effect. Okay, let's crack on. Our first exam answer says, <laughs> Ancient Egypt was inhabited by mummies and they all wrote in hydraulics. <laughs> <laughs> Writing in hydraulics, very forceful words, the power of language. It takes on a different meaning if you have hydraulic writing. They lived in the Sarah desert. <laughs> so is that Sarah Lee, do you think? Maybe. Next time you open a Sarah Lee package, or maybe you've had, made a Sarah Lee cake, have you ever opened it and found an Egyptian mummy inside? Or maybe some hydraulic writing? The climate of the Sarah is such that the inhabitants have to live elsewhere. Well, isn't that wonderful? So you're an inhabitant of the Sarah, but also living elsewhere. Maybe it's a bit of a, like a holiday home. The Bible is a book full of caricatures. <laughs> In the first book of the Bible, Guinnesses, Adam and Eve were created from an apple tree. One of their children, Cain, asked, Am I my brother's son? <laughs> oh, don't you love it? I know there's Adam and Eve and there's something to do with an apple. Are they made from a bit of cosmic whittling going on? Ah, yes, I've made a nice little figurine. We'll call that one Adam. Oh, dear. And Cain, am I my brother's son? Yes. Well, you can't blame him for not understanding family ties. It was, after all, right at the beginning of history. Things were still being worked out. Moses led the Hebrew slaves to the Red Sea, where they made unleavened bread, which is bread made without any ingredients. <laughs> Can you imagine by, I'm going to go and look for some like mozza or unleavened bread in the shop and look at the ingredients, see if it says, mix a handful of nothing in a jug, bake for 20 minutes, and you have unleavened bread. <laughs> this, this person carries on, this young, young person. Moses went up on Mount Sinai. Oh dear, to get the Ten Commandments. He died before he ever reached Canada. <laughs> so uh, Cana, or Canaan, would have been the place he was going to, in case you don't know. But Mount Sinai, surprised he survived. Our next student tells us quite stridently, the Greeks were a highly sculptured people. <laughs> and without them, we wouldn't have history. What did the Greeks give us? Body sculpting. Our next answer, by our young high school examinees, finally set straight a scandal in historic literature. They say, actually, Homer was not written by Homer, but by another man of that name. <laughs> Thank goodness that this fraud was uncovered. Everybody stop the printing presses. Homer did not write Homer. Scrap that. Put the new name on. What is it? Homer. <laughs> but it's another Homer, okay? I don't know about you, but I'd love to have the Iliad and the Odyssey with the author's name, the other Homer. <laughs> 
Okay. Carrying on in Greece, Socrates was a famous Greek teacher who went around giving people advice. <laughs> they killed him. <laughs> Socrates died from an overdose of wedlock. <laughs> That's amazing. Oh dear. We've got to put him to death, guys. Well, how are we going to do that? I know what will finish him off. Let's marry him multiple times until he can't take it no more. <laughs> it's supposed to be Hemlock, of course, that Socrates drunk. After his death, his career suffered a dramatic decline. Yes, well, it would, wouldn't it? Although I do believe they must mean his reputation. Evidently, the youngsters who were taught about the Greeks back in the 90s were having a lot of confusion in getting a grasp on things because the next one is about the Greeks as well. In the Olympic Games, Greeks ran races, jumped and hurled the biscuits. <laughs> Are you with me? Shall we set up a website where we get a petition for the Olympic, the International Olympics Committee and demand that they reinstall the great sport of hurling the biscuits. <laughs> like, do you know what? I think viewership of the Olympics would skyrocket if you had that sport in. Have you ever tried that sport yourself? I might do a bit of it tonight with the kids. In our next answer, we are reminded of a particularly great event in the life of Julius Caesar. Julius Caesar extinguished himself on the battlefields of Gaul. <laughs> this account, if you remember your history, was when Julius Caesar had had an accident with the deep friar and went pell-mell running out into the fields of Gaul looking for something to douse himself with. <laughs> the Ides of March murdered him. Well, okay, because they thought he was going to be made king. Dying, he gasped out. <laughs> Tee hee, Brutus! <laughs> That's Caesar! The best last words ever! Tee hee, Brutus! Maybe Brutus was wearing a clown wig and big shoes, and Julius Caesar, although upset about being killed by his best friend, thought at least he looks funny. Ah, oh, that's great. Moving on to another Roman emperor. Nero was a cruel tyranny who would torture his subjects by playing the fiddle to them. It does make you wonder what these kids were thinking when they heard their teachers explaining this and that they never thought to put up their hand and say, really, miss, or really, sir, he played the fiddle to them to torture. <laughs> Whoever wrote this must have thought people back in the Roman days weren't very resilient, you know, a bit of fiddle playing and you were tortured. I give in, I give in. For goodness sake, bring out the piano. <laughs> The twelfth answer that I've got on my list tickles me immensely. Joan of Arc! <laughs> Joan of Arc was burned to a stake! <laughs> it gets better! And was canonised by Bernard Shaw! <laughs> I have no idea what they were thinking with this. Who knew that Bernard Shaw has his own pantheon of saints? St. Joan of Arc was burnt to a stake. <laughs> Finally, Magna Carta provided that no man should be hanged twice for the same offence. <laughs> what were they thinking when they thought that someone could be hung twice for the same offence? <laughs> Did you hear old Jethro got hung for stealing? Oh, he stole from me. Right, dig him up, gotta hang him again. <laughs> Thank goodness for the Magna Carta, you could be hung, put in your grave, and rest easy. <laughs> How about this one? In medieval times, most people were illiterate. <laughs> wow, they must have had seriously good brains to think of alliteration immediately as they spoke. Um, ah, jubilant John Johnson, what wicked weather we wait with. <laughs> Tis true, Tiny Tim. Torrential, turbulent typhoons. <laughs> Those medieval lot, they were dead clever. No wonder Shakespeare found it easy if you were brought up like that. 
The greatest writer of the futile ages was Chaucer, who wrote many poems and verses and also wrote literature. <laughs> this is poems, verses, but that's not literature. This is literature. Another story was William Tell, who shot an arrow through an apple while standing on his son's head. <laughs> Hold still, will you? <laughs> Come on, lad. Hold still. Queen Elizabeth was the Virgin Queen. As a queen, she was a success. When she exposed herself before her troops, they all shouted, hurrah! <laughs> well, you know, that's that little bit just before the Armada to G up the spirits of the men. Queen Elizabeth, lover, went out and exposed herself before them. And a great day was had by all. <laughs> Now, moving on more to the Renaissance and developing of technology and ideas, we have this wonderful paragraph. It was an age of great inventions and discoveries. Gutenberg invented removable type and the Bible. <laughs> you didn't know that, did you? Gutenberg wrote the whole lot, just put different names on all the way through. Another important invention was the circulation of blood. <laughs> This revolutionised modern living, you would imagine. <laughs> Up until then, people were very sluggish and slow. <laughs> Sir Walter Raleigh is a historical figure because he invented cigarettes <laughs> and started smoking. And Sir Francis Drake... <laughs> <laughs> and Sir Francis Drake circumcised the world with a hundred foot clipper. <laughs> No, this won't do. We're going to need to do people en masse. Have you got anything bigger? Something about, say, a hundred foot? <laughs> <laughs> In case you're wondering, I think they meant he circumscribed the world, not circumcised the world in his hundred foot clipper. The greatest writer of the Renaissance was William Shakespeare. He was born in the year 1564, supposedly on his birthday. <laughs> Date of birth? Hmm, yes, well, we'll see about that. <laughs> he never made much money and is famous only because of his plays. He wrote tragedies, comedies and hysterectomies. <laughs> All in Islamic pentameter. <laughs> that, that famous metre of the English language, Islamic pentameter. Can't beat it, can you? Had a bit of a jaunt over in the Holy Land. Met a few friends, learned a new style of writing, brought back Islamic pentameter. Romeo and Juliet are an example of a heroic couplet. <laughs> <laughs> Romeo's last wish was to be laid by Juliet. <laughs> Doesn't that highlight the importance of making one's meaning a bit clearer? <laughs> Writing at the same time as Shakespeare was Miguel Cervantes. He wrote Don Quixote. <laughs> the next great author was John Milton. Milton wrote Paradise Lost. Then his wife died and he wrote Paradise Regained. <laughs> so that's where he got his inspiration from. Okay, ooh, a bit of American history now. During the Renaissance, America began. <laughs> you see, there was just an ocean there before. <laughs> but people went over and started throwing mud into the sea until they built America. Christopher Columbus was a great navigator who discovered America while cursing about the Atlantic. <laughs> I'll read that again. Christopher Columbus was a great navigator who discovered America <laughs> while cursing about the Atlantic. Instead of cruising, in case you're wondering, oh, that gives you a great image, doesn't it? Set sail from Spain. All the whales could hear for miles around in the Atlantic was Columbus swearing and casting imprecations over the side of his ship. Still in America, later, the pilgrims crossed the ocean. 
and this was called Pilgrim's Progress. <laughs> the winter of 1620 was a hard one for the settlers. Many people died and many babies were born. Captain John Smith was responsible for all this. <laughs> well, if they're going to pull statues down, I suppose they better get on with pulling down Captain John Smith. After all, he was a mass murderer and the greatest philanderer the world had ever known. One of the causes of the Revolutionary War was the English put tax in their tea. <laughs> Cup of tea? Yes, I wouldn't mind. Tar very much. Skin off the nose. Oh, you little swine, there's a tack in that. That's it. I'm going to start a revolution. <laughs> oh, here's another reason for the Revolutionary War. Also, the colonists would send their parcels through the post without stamps. <laughs> Those blasted colonists are sending their parcels without stamps again, ruining the Royal Mail. <laughs> got, a, got a backlog here. Finally, the colonists won the war and no longer had to pay for taxes. That was a, a great boon for the Americans. Delegates from the original 13 states formed the Contented Congress. Thomas Jefferson, <laughs> a virgin. <laughs> Very specific detail about Jefferson there. And Benjamin Franklin were two singers of the Declaration of Independence. Franklin discovered electricity by rubbing two cats backwards <laughs> and declared a horse divided against itself cannot stand. Well, that's true. Franklin died in 1790 and is still dead. <laughs> Soon the Constitution of the United States was adopted to secure domestic hostility. <laughs> Under the Constitution, the people enjoyed the right to keep bare arms. Well, that's nice. It's nice to know. T-shirts, of course, were banned in Europe, but not in America. Not after the Constitution allowed bare arms. How about the great president, Abraham Lincoln? Abraham Lincoln became America's greatest precedent. <laughs> so I suppose that means every president should be asking themselves, what would Abraham Lincoln do if he was the greatest president? Lincoln's mother died in infancy. <laughs> and he was born in a log cabin, which he built with his own hands. <laughs> Abraham freed the slaves by signing the Emasculation Proclamation. <laughs> Ooh, can you imagine his government cabinet? Are you sure, Abe? Do we really have to do this? As someone comes out with the shears. Yes, yes, it's for the greater good, believe me. <laughs> On the night of April 14th, 1865, Lincoln went to the theatre and got shot in his seat <laughs> by one of the actors in a moving picture show. The believed assassinator was John Wilkes Booth, a supposedly insane actor. This ruined Booth's career. <laughs> Meanwhile, in Europe, the Enlightenment was a reasonable time. Voltaire invented... <laughs> Voltaire invented electricity, which is why it's called Volts, and wrote a book called Candy <laughs> instead of Candide. Gravity was invented by Isaac Walton. Ah, <laughs> oh, you gotta love the Waltons. It is chiefly noticeable in the autumn when the apples are falling off trees. Well, this is very true. I, I have a, a friend who has an orchard and I tell you what, come autumn, the gravity around that place is terrifying. <laughs> apples falling everywhere. How about a bit of chamber music? Johann Bach wrote a great many musical compositions and had a large number of children. In between, he practised on an old spinster. <laughs> in between, he practised on an old spinster, which he kept up in his attic. <laughs> Ooh. Bark died from 1750 to the present. <laughs> I wonder if he's got any intention. Maybe he's cryogenically frozen, waiting to be returned. Bach was the most famous composer in the world, and so was Handel. <laughs> Handel? <laughs> I'm so sorry. 
Handel was half German, half Italian, and half English. He was very large. <laughs> You think Bach and Handel's life is interesting? Wait till you hear about Beethoven. Beethoven wrote music even though he was deaf. He was so deaf he wrote loud music. <laughs> he took long walks in the forest even when everyone was calling for him. <laughs> Beethoven expired in 1827 and later died for this. <laughs> How dare you expire? Kill him! The French Revolution was accomplished before it happened <laughs> and catapulted into Napoleon. <laughs> That's inspired writing. I'm sorry. I wish I could write like that. Napoleon wanted an heir to inherit his power, but since Josephine was a baroness, she couldn't have any children. <laughs> sorry, love. No children until you can elevate me to a duchess. <laughs> Ooh la la. The 19th century was a time of a great many thoughts and inventions. People stopped reproducing by hand and started reproducing by machine. The invention of the steamboat caused a network of rivers to spring up, which weren't there before, evidently. I've invented this boat. What does it do? It floats in water. Oh, well, where are you going to use it? Hang about. What's this? Rivers. Louis Pasteur discovered a cure for rabbis. <laughs> Charles Darwin was a naturalist who wrote the organ of the species. He doesn't specify which organ, but he wrote about one of them anyway. Madman Curie discovered radio. <laughs> well, I hope you enjoyed those exam answers as much as I did. That a lot of them took me by surprise. Like I say, they are from the 1990s, so they weren't just made up on the internet. And I only just refound them, so I couldn't remember most of them. All I can say is, isn't language brilliant? The ability to move us to tears, but also to make us giggle and squeal like little children all over again. Let me know what you think of this video down in the comments. Have you heard any brilliant exam answers yourself or some great misquotes, which I might do a video on that if you, if you fancy. Leave the, them in the comments down below so we can all have a chuckle. And until the next video, I wish you joy in your reading.